Dear family in Christ, united here at Grace, may God's grace, mercy, and His peace be with you now and always. Amen. Please pray with me. Most Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending us a salvation through Christ Jesus, your Son. Help us each day to recognize the promise of faith that you have given to us. Help us each day to not only receive that gift, but to share it with others. May your Holy Spirit work in our lives and in our hearts, that all may come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, as I mentioned, we begin our sermon series. Our sermon series on various heresies or false teachings that have invaded the church in the past. And I started off with kind of what I thought was a little bit of a humorous title for this series, which is, You Might Be a Heretic If. And I took that from a little bit that, if maybe you know Jeff Foxworthy, if you've heard of him before, he refers to certain people as rednecks, and he does this, You, you Might Be a Redneck skit. Well, throughout this skit, he uses various things in these people's lives to describe them. You might be a redneck if, and he goes on from there. Well, heresies are not funny, but one of the things that we are going to do is talk about how they pervade the way we talk, the way we think, the way we live. See, heresies, false teachings, have a way of weaseling themselves in before we even realizing. In fact, they have a tendency to slither into our conversations without us even thinking about it. So we're going to start with the heresy today of Gnosticism. Many of you probably have heard of this heresy before, maybe uh, maybe not so much by name of heresy, but at least have heard that term Gnostic before. Gnosticism is a term that is prevalent not only in the days of Christ, but in our day as well. In fact, I would hopefully, by the end of our sermon today, hopefully have you see how prevalent Gnosticism is in our world today. Gnosticism is, well, it's hard to describe because it is a broad context. There are many sects, various different groups of Gnostics throughout the world. There were many in the day of Jesus. But what I can do is give you some of the basic tenets. And when you think of Gnosticism, uh, hopefully first you'll think about gnosis, or really uh, that Greek word, knowledge, because that's what Gnosticism is based on, is knowledge. In fact, this is not a new concept, not a description that we came up with. This is a term that's used throughout Scripture. In fact, one example is Paul's words in Ephesians 3. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's right from Ephesians 3, where we were reading earlier today. So I don't want you to think that Gnosticism is a, well, sometime later in the 12th century or something, we came up with this term. But Gnosis, Gnosticism, was in, around right at the time of Christ. In fact, it started about 400 years before Christ. Many of you maybe have heard of a Greek philosopher by the name of Plato. Plato taught uh, that there was a certain dualism to his teaching. And I'll, don't worry, I'll get to what dualism is in just a moment. But Plato taught that there was a certain dualism, this idea that there was a division between what is good and evil, that they were equal sides, or uh, spiritual or physical. And like I said, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But he was a student of Socrates, and he taught this gnosis. He influenced it. And the basic idea was that there was some kind of secret spiritual knowledge. The Gnostics taught that there was some secret knowledge. And if you forget everything else I preach in the sermon today, remember this. We have seen the revelation of Christ, salvation for us through the Holy Spirit. There is no secret knowledge to be saved. There is no special code. There is no enlightenment that we have to attain. But salvation comes to us by Christ's Christ's death on the cross. He did physically die. He physically rose. And he give, has given us a promise that we too, though we will die, will rise. Now, like I say, I want to teach you a little bit more about this Gnostic teaching, though. But if you forget everything else, make sure you remember that part. So although Gnosticism started long before Christ came on the scene, it was something that he had to deal with in his own time. In fact, we see that throughout the epistles that there are certain responses to Gnosticism. In fact, the, the epistle of John, 1 John, if you need a primer, he responds time and again to Gnosticism. But let's start with that first teaching I was telling you about dualism. Gnostics are what is called dualistic. Like I said, as I mentioned briefly, they believe that there's an equal, equalness between good and evil in the world. That there are two co- sides to the same coin, if you will. And maybe a way for you to remember this is the, the Taoistic belief of the yin and the yang. 
Many of you probably have seen that. It's a, it's a circle, and on one side it's white, and on the other side it's black. It has a black dot in the white side and a white dot in the black side. Well, that is a very dualistic idea. That is the idea that there's just as much evil as good in the world. Gnostics believed this. They taught this. In fact, this goes back to their very foundation, their understanding. They believed, way, way, way back, before the creation of the world, there was this supreme being. They called him the supreme being of light. So far, we're not so far off page, right? That sounds, we, okay, maybe we wouldn't use that terminology. But let me tell you about what they believed about the supreme being of light. They believed that he had emanations. In other words, he had seeds that he sowed that he would reproduce his own, by himself his own sub-gods, or what they called demiurges. Hopefully you're writing this all down, right? Uh, no, well, these demiurges then, were, they were underneath this supreme god. Well, one of the demiurges was what, call, what was named Sophos. Hopefully you're thinking to yourself, you've heard that term Sophos before, sophisticated. It, it's, our, it's the Greek word actually for wisdom. So when we talk about uh, Sophia, it's a, that's a name meaning wisdom. Well, from, so from this supreme being came these demiurges, Sophia, uh, goodness. We, we would think about them maybe the natures of God. Well, underneath that, underneath that then wa was a, another emanation, another demiurge, and this one was named Tahil. Now, Tahil was a bit of a rascal. See, the supreme being, he was entirely spiritual. He was all energy. And so it was important for him to consider, uh, so, so everything was, uh, that was good and that was holy was energy. Well, Tahil, like I said, was a bit of a rascal. And he created the physical world. He created the physical world as an affront to the supreme being. So, and this is their teaching, the Gnostic teachings. And so the way that Gnostics look at the created world as if it's a bad thing. They look at the created world, the physical world, as if it's an evil thing. So the highest attainment for a Gnostic would be to put off this physical life, to turn to the spiritual. So far, are you following? Hopefully your, your, your bells are going off in your head here because this is a, an affront to what God's Word says. Come back with me to the very beginning. Come back to Genesis chapter 1. Listen again to the way that God referred to the created world. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Notice God didn't just say it was tov, not that he said it was good, but it was very good. The created world that he had created was very good. And this is not just the problem that we're talking about here. But think about then this idea of what dualism must mean. If there's equal parts good and equal parts evil, this is a scary thought for us as, pe as the people of God. Because that would mean that Satan is equal to God. That the evil is just a concept and that good is just a concept. And, well, two sides of the same coin, so it doesn't matter. Well, that flies right in the face of God's word. You might be thinking to yourself, well, wait. Jesus talks about the, kingdom, the, the left and the right, the sheep and the goats. He talks about the good and the evil. But what he's referring to is the way that sin has corrupted what God has made good. When Jesus talks about that division, he's not talking about a division that started from the very beginning, but a division that came after sin entered the world. God is the creator God. He is the all-powerful God. And he is the one who has created all things, and including all of the angels, including Satan. And so when we think about this idea of dualism, that the physical is bad, the spiritual is good, that there is just good and evil, we need to be reminded that there is good in God and only good in God. And that when Christ comes again, he will restore all of creation. The second aspect of the Gnostic teaching that hopefully is an affront to you is to think that there's multiple gods. We're not polytheists. or multi believe, We don't believe there are multiple gods. We are monotheists. We believe that there is one God. Now, albeit we believe that there are triune, that we are, we are triune monotheists. In other words, we believe in the three natures of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we're not talking about multiple gods there. In fact, if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, the very beginning of the Shema, as it was called, it starts out, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. 
There are not two gods. There are not three gods. There are not multiple gods. There is one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this brings us great hope because when we look out the last day, we know the promise that has been given to us. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who... who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. You have a double promise there. Not only that Jesus has destroyed sin, death, and the devil, but that promise that the physical is not an evil thing. The promise that on our, in the resurrection, we will rise again with our physical bodies. Hopefully you're following so far because we're going to keep going here. The next aspect I want to teach you is what's called syncretism. Now, syncretism, basically put, is the the mixing together of thoughts. They may be thoughts that seem to come together, or they may be thoughts that seem entirely different, uh, contradictory thoughts. But the syncretism in and of itself, it it actually comes from this uh, Greek idea that you could mix uh, together uh, different uh, Greek tribes, different Greek sects. And so it was really more of uh, the melting pot idea originally. But the word, as it's come into religious use, into theological use, actually syncretism then refers to this idea of That there is not one truth, but there are multiple truths. That you look and you take scripture, and maybe you take a philosophy from Plato, and maybe a philosophy from Socrates, and you combine them together and you look, and whatever comes out is what is right. Now hopefully hopefully you're hearing that and you can realize that this has not gone away. We live in a society today that is very relativistic, that takes truth, as the measure of truth actually comes from the individual, not from the word. Well, let me give you an example, actually, of where this syncretism can lead. There was a, well, actually, it was a Hellenistic Jew, so a Greek Jew by the name of Philo living in Egypt at the time of Christ. Not Fido the dog, but Philo. And this Philo, he was actually, uh, he was a well-raised Jew. Uh, he was educated in the Torah, the whole books of God's Word, the Old Testament. But he not only took God's Word, that Old Testament Word, But he combined it with what he had learned as a Greek Jew. And and let me explain what happens here. When Alexander the Great was leading his charge across the country and across the known world at the time, he came in and and part of the way of enforcing his power was he went ahead and he made everybody change their names. So instead of having a Jewish name, he has the name Philo. And they had to uh, t- take on uh, Greek culture, in other words, the style of dress, the cho- choices that they would make in terms of morality. Uh, and, and then further, the, he would enforce the Greek religion, then this idea that uh, the God had Zeus and, and coming down from him. Well, so this was the influence on Philo. And so what Philo then was t- actually came about was, it, it almost sounds Christian, believe it or not. He read the Old Testament, and he looked at the pre-incarnate Christ. He looked at when Moses encountered the burning bush, and he thought to himself, well, that was what he called the logos. Now, logos is the Greek word for word, actually. And he believed that God came and dwelt among his people in a spiritual sense. Like I said, it almost sounds Christian, doesn't it? But we hold to the truth that God came and dwelt among his people physically. That God did not merely come spiritually, but he came physically. The problem with syncretism then is the fact that it puts all truths on the same level. There is no higher truth, the truth of God's word. And that contradicts Jesus' own words. In John chapter, chapter 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And if that's not enough, we, Peter emphasizes it further in Acts chapter 4 when he writes, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is one truth. There is one way of salvation. And I know it is popular in our world today to believe that there is a coexistence an easy coexistence, that all truths, whatever is true for you is true for you, whatever is true for me is true for me. But God's Word is very clear. Unless you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is no other path to salvation. Every other path, every other path leads to damnation. And that is a problem with syncretism. 
is it does not hold God as true as the true way of salvation. Well, the last aspect I'd like to teach you about from Gnosticism today, just in case this hasn't been enough yet, is that they were also what was called docetists. And I'll spell that one for you. It's D-O-C-E-T-I-S-T. But it came from another Greek word, dokeo. Now, dokeo, uh, basically, it, it usually isn't translated when we see that in the Bible. It's a conditional statement. So w- where we would read an if and then, uh, it, you would automatically see that when you read that in the Greek. It, there is one occasion, at least in Ephesians, where, where, Paul, where Paul does translate it. And listen, you'll hear the condition here. For if anyone thinks he is something... When he is nothing, he deceives himself. It, it, did you hear that? If anyone thinks he is something, that condition there. And that's basically what Dokeo suggested. But I want you to hear it today as to seem. And this was very much part of what undermined Christianity in that time. This is what undermined the truth of salvation in Jesus' day and can easily undermine our faith. Because Dokeo took this perspective that Jesus only seemed to be crucified. Jesus only seemed to rise from the grave. And we kind of can see where that came about, can't we? If we go back to that dualism, this idea that the physical is bad and the spiritual is good, we can see why they would have had to say that Jesus only seemed to be physical. He only seemed to dwell among with the, the people of God on this earth. Because if he was physical, what would that, according to Gnosticism, mean? He was evil, right? And if you're trying to make a Gnostic Christianity, you can't have an evil God. And so they said he seemed. But this is a huge problem, because when we think about the fact, if Jesus only seemed to die on the cross for your sins, does that mean you only seem to have salvation? If Jesus only seemed to take our place, does that mean that he actually took our place? If Jesus only seemed to rise from the grave, do we really have salvation? It's interesting because a lot of Gnostics, they, they'll, they'll draw on John chapter 20. And John 20 is probably a fairly familiar scripture. It's when Jesus came back to the, uh, to the disciples and revealed himself. But they'll, dr- they'll turn to John 20, for instance, John 20, 19. And listen, because it almost seems like they're correct. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Well, this is perfect if we're Gnostic. Well, how did he get through the doors? How did he get through the roof? How did he get in there? Well, if he only seemed to be physical, it would be perfect, right? Except we have the rest of John chapter 20. A good reason not to just read one verse of Scripture and take it out of context. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. In a very physical way, God told Thomas, Jam your finger into my hand. Jab your hand into my side. He was not just a premonition. He was not just a ghost. Not just seemingly to be there. He was physically there. And Paul gets at the heart of why this is so important. When we turn to 1 Corinthians 15, he tells us if we don't have a physical crucifixion and a physical resurrection, everything is lost. Listen here to Paul's words and read the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, please, this afternoon, because it's worth it. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Do you hear what he said? If there is no physical resurrection, why bother preaching? Why bother coming to church? Why bother believing at all? Because life is hopeless. But if you read the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, you see this beautiful text where Paul talks about the fact that Jesus did not just seem to rise from the grave, but that he conquered death, sin, and the devil. And he did conquer the grave, giving us the promise of eternal life. Now I know Gnosticism may sound like an ancient heresy. It may sound like I threw a bunch of Greek words at you. But I want you to think about the concepts for just a minute. How often in our world do we talk 
even as Christians, with a dualistic tone to our voices? How many of you talk about people getting what they deserve, even wanting them to be smited as they deserve to be smited? Isn't that dualistic? This idea that, well, God is good to me, but he better pour out the wrath on them. Or how about the relativism we face today? The idea that truth is simply a measure for me, but there's no objective truth. Sounds awful lot like syncretism. Or how about this seemingly? How many times have you talked to Christians, maybe not in this congregation, but Christians who said, well, the resurrection isn't that important. You know, we're going to die and go to heaven anyway, so what difference does it make? That's docetism, folks. And in case you don't see these small concepts throughout our world, there are groups who are literally, right now, they call themselves Gnostics. There is a rock band out there called Gnosis. There's another one called Tahil. And if you read any of their lyrics, you'll see what they believe. And this is not a dead heresy. Back in the 50s and 60s, there was a Reformed theologian who seemed to think that Gnosticism was dying off. That Gnosticism, by the time we got to you know, 2015 here, that it'd be dead. Well, let's look around us and we can see how it's on the rise. There is a spiritualism that has come with the postmodern age that comes back to this idea of what we measure and truth no longer holds the same sway. There's a Spanish philosopher, George Santiana, not George Santana, but George Santiana, and he says a phrase, a quote that many of you I'm sure know, at least you maybe different ways, but those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And how that true that is, when we as the people of God do not look at our history, when we as the people of God do not take time to consider the heresies that have atta attacked in the past, how easy is it for it to slip into our with the way we talk and the way we think? How easy is it for us to forget that we do have truth? We have truth in God's Word and truth that is meant to be proclaimed. I encourage you to turn with me to Ephesians 3 now. I'm just going to read a couple of last verses as Paul, as we wrap up today. But Paul reminds us that we have the truth and we have not a mystery, but we have the mystery revealed to reveal to others. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that He has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and we have access with confidence through our faith in Him. What a message of truth to proclaim. We as the church have boldness. We have confidence that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no secret knowledge. I don't care what Dan Brown says. I don't care what some of these pseudepigraphal gospels that are out there, or uh, false names, by the way. Pseudepigraphal means false names. What these false named gospels, like Gospel of Judas or Thomas, say, there is no secret knowledge of salvation. There is one way of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. If you forget everything else, make sure you never forget that. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you for sending the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the way of salvation. May we too as your church always be prepared to make a defense for your good word, for your promise of salvation. May we as your church always speak with boldness and with confidence proclaiming that you alone are the way of salvation. May we as your church uphold truth, sharing your love with others. Forgive us for those times when we fail. Reassure us that you did not merely seem to die on the cross, but that you have died on the cross for each and every one of those sins, and that we now look forward to life eternal with you forever. May this be our boldness and our confidence this day and every day. This we pray in the name of our powerful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.